sentence for today. I am the way and the truth and the life, says the Lord. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Christ is risen. Alleluia. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let us pray our gathering prayer together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been offered for us. Therefore, we come to celebrate the festival. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith with a sincere and true heart. Merciful God, our maker and our judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you, set you free from all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, sorry. Sing up. Let us pray. Ever-living God, whose Son Jesus Christ is the way, the truth and the life, give us grace to love one another, to follow in the way of his commandments and to share his risen life. He who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. One Peter two, chapter two, verses eleven to twenty-five. Oh, 
steps. I was so used to doing it before. Sorry. No, she builds in for me a lot. And uh, so, <laughs> uh, Acts 7, 55 to 60, uh, the martyrdom of Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and with a loud shout, all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died for the word of the Lord. morning psalm is 31 verses 1 to 5 and 17 and 18 to you lord have i come for shelter let me never be put to shame O oh, deliver me in your righteousness climb your ear to me and be swift to save me be for me a rock of refuge a fortress to defend me for you are my high rock and my stronghold Lead me and guide me for your name's sake. Bring me out of the net that have secretly laid for me, for you are my strength. Into your hands I commit my spirit. You will redeem. All my days are in your hand. O deliver me from the power of my enemies and from my persecutors. Make your face to shine upon your servant and save me for your mercy's sake. And now we'll hear from God. <laughs> Sorry about that. So this is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 to 25. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and exiles to abstain from the desires of the flesh, that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honourably among the Gentiles, so that though they malign you as evildoers, they may see your honourable deeds and glorify God when he comes to judge. For the Lord's sake, accept authority of every human institution, whether the emperor is supreme or of governors as sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to praise those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing right you should silence the ignorance of the foolish. As servants of God, live as free people, yet do not use your freedom as a pretext for evil. Honour everyone, love the family of believers, fear God, honour the emperor. Slaves, accept the authority of your masters with all deference, not only those who are kind and gentle, but also those who are harsh. For it is a credit to you if, being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entered himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that, free from sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you have 
who before for you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. For the word of the Lord. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John, chapter 14, beginning at the first verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you, do, you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. For the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. I speak to you in the name of God, whom we know as 
Creator, Redeemer and Sanctifier. Please be seated. So I apologise again at the beginning of this sermon. Um, as I told you, I, Bishop Sonia rang me on Friday evening and asked if I would continue to serve as your locum while Red and Kate is on sick leave. Clearly I said yes. But do I have to give the flowers back now? No. <laughs> <laughs> They're still going, by the way. And the most evident effect is that I had prepared nothing for today. I knew the, what the gospel reading was, but preaching on this gospel extract was the last thing on my mind. I had been thinking about it because the first part of this reading is what the Wilson girls have chosen for Ron's funeral. And that's another story. Come and listen again on Thursday. So this sermon is heavily dependent on some of the preachers I follow on the internet. First of all, let's look at the context of this part of John's Gospel. Chapters 13 to 17 are known as the farewell discourse in John's Gospel. In chapter 13, we read about Jesus washing the disciples' feet, their last shared meal, the withdrawal of Judas going off to the dark side. And chapter 14 gives us the direct words of Jesus to his disciples about his impending departure. So the words today we heard were of comfort and hope, were of promise. It was plain speaking and Jesus does not resile from describing what will soon take place. It might seem a bit strange to you or to anybody that a chapter in which Jesus offers his formal goodbyes to his disciples is heard in the Sundays after the resurrection. After all, at this stage, in Eastertide, Jesus is, well, he's back already, isn't he? But if we keep our minds open, we can learn what resurrection means for John the Evangelist. And this can help us in living into the promise of resurrection beyond this particular season of the church year. In the farewell discourse, Jesus is not only saying his goodbyes, but his words anticipate the events which are ahead of him at this stage. So his arrest, his betrayal, the arrest, the crucifixion, the resurrection and the ascension. And every one of these events is a result of Jesus being human. Jesus being human, the incarnation is for John the primary theological event in the story. The disciples will be confronted with the end of the incarnation, that is, the end of Jesus' presence here on earth. But Jesus wants them to know that there is more beyond the crucifixion. And for John, that's the inevitable result of being human. Human beings die by one means or another, John is heavy on the incarnation, remember that. Jesus knows that after the crucifixion, the resurrection, and then the ascension comes, they're the next events in store for him and for his disciples, for for those who believe in him, for us. Now, one of the characteristics of Jesus' farewell discourse is that it describes not resurrected life, but ascended life with God, life after the ascension. And just as Jesus ascends to the Father, so will the followers of Jesus. Indeed, he goes to prepare an abiding place for them and for us. So in the light of that context, we need to hear these introductory statements of the farewell discourse. Most of us have heard the opening verses of this reading at funerals or memorial service. That image of a great mansion with many rooms or a huge number of dwelling places for those who've died sounds like Jesus' main objective, like a building project, if you like. Pity can't come and do something about the housing situation in Australia. This is Jesus going to prepare places to welcome loved ones who have died. I think think this is, I can take this as an accurate description of this text because if those dwelling places, 
are not real and not, don't exist, well, neither does being in the presence of God because the dwelling places are to be with God. Well, I really like the description in the bosom of the Father. Imagine that. Resurrection looks towards ascension. Ascension, which means being with God, with Jesus, sharing that loving bond because where Jesus is, we will be. And here's Thomas. Don't you love Thomas? He's the guy with the literal brain. Where are you going, Jesus? Come on, give us the coordinates. Give us a map. Tell us what to put in the sat map. Can you imagine Jesus rolling his eyes? This is another misunderstanding, lack of comprehension. And Jesus gives us more, one of the more well-known and sometimes poorly used I am statements. He says... I am the way and the truth and the life. There are seven I am statements in this gospel and they help us understand Jesus as the source of life, of abundant over-the-top grace and they also signify the presence of God. But, but if you take them out of this context that we heard them in today, this conversation between Jesus and Thomas... Remember that this is the last time that Jesus and his disciples are gathered before his arrest and crucifixion. This I am statement, unfortunately, has become fodder for those who need clear proof that Jesus is the sole means of salvation, no matter how salvation is described or defined. That's one issue. But the other, even more distressing effect of the misappropriation of this I am statement from this narrative setting, is that it's used as an indicator of God's judgment, of God's exclusion, of God's absence. Read on, my friends. Read on in the passage. And we realise that the Father has already come, is already present in the life and ministry of Jesus. If you know me, which implies if you know me and you do, they're not conditional words. They're comforting words for the disciples and for us. There's nothing uncertain for them in the present or in the future because of their relationship with Jesus and Jesus wants them and us to be secure in that. But here we go again. More misunderstanding. Philip asked Jesus to show them the Father. And apart from rolling his eyes... Jesus gets out the big guns and without ambiguity declares his identity. Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen the Father, has seen me, has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? So the farewell discourse is actually no different to the other dialogues and discourses in this gospel. Again, we see a movement from misunderstanding to recognition. Recognition of who Jesus is revealing himself to be. Here in this discourse, however, the stakes are higher. The farewell discourse is not only Jesus' parting word to comfort his disciples, but a clarification of what will happen next. And Jesus doesn't want the disciples to misinterpret those events of the passion, the crucifixion. And for us, in our context, the question may be, who do you think God is, really? And what do you think God is most concerned about? Well, God looks like Jesus, God acts like Jesus, and God is concerned about the things that Jesus' followers saw his action address, actions address all the way to the cross. What is God like? God is like Jesus. The Jesus who will sit down with 5,000 strangers, prostitutes, Pharisees, Greeks and Jews, peasants and priests, to share a meal handed from hand to hand with no opportunities to check out the purity of the kitchen where the bread was baked 
or the cleanliness of the countless pairs of hands that got the food to you. God is like Jesus. Jesus, who was reviled, persecuted, tortured and executed and yet spoke words of forgiveness to his tormentors, just as Stephen did today. God is like Jesus, who taught us that the kingdom of God would be ushered in, not with political and military muscle of kings and generals, but quietly raised from mustard seeds of touching the unclean, feeding the hungry, healing those bound by disease, inviting the outcast, reconciling enemies. If we, as disciples, believe Jesus then we can stop saying to ourselves and other people, oh, no, 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 that's too hard. Who, me? No, no, I can't do that. And we can live into the reality of Jesus as the way until everyone whom God made and loves can tell the story of God's people as their own. As Peter said, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You are a holy nation, a people set apart. God loves you beyond your imaginings and God wants you to be with him. That's it in a bit. There is no more. God loves you with an unending and imperishable love. Thanks be to God. Let's stand down together, affirm the faith of the church. What do we believe? We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty maker of heaven and earth, where it is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him, for us and for our salvation, he came from heaven, was incarnate. The Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and seated at the right hand, he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit. The Lord, the giver of life, proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. An apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray now for the world and for the church. The prayer I've chosen for today is um, the Casillo prayer for May. And I've chosen it because it fits a bit with, um, with how we see Jesus, who didn't just hang around with the, the goody two-shoes and all the posh people. And the person who wrote this prayer said that her prayer time had become predictable and a bit banal. And she realised she was only praying for good people. But there are lots of others who need our prayers and we're going to lift them to God now. Almighty God who can do all things, powerful God who has promised a plan for our lives to prosper us and do no harm, we come before you today to pray for what seems the impossible. But we trust you, Lord. We trust that nothing is impossible for you. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. 
We pray for those who are angry and aggressive. We pray that they find gentleness and compassion. We pray for those who are controlling and abusive. We pray that they will be released from the need to have power over others. We pray, Lord, for the perverted and the deviant. We pray that you will wash away the corruption and abnormalities. Lord, we pray for those who are cold and cruel. We pray that you and we might show them warmth and kindness that they may see and learn another way to exist. Gracious Lord, we pray for the liars and deceivers in our lives. We pray that by our example and your grace, they may learn trust and sincerity. Loving Lord, we pray for the greedy and the selfish. As we practice gratitude and thankfulness, Lord, we pray that they will learn to be grateful and thankful. Lord, we pray for those who are lazy and selfish. We pray that through our example and your grace, they will be encouraged to actively participate in community and family, sharing the load and the responsibilities. Gracious Lord, we pray for the thieves and the criminals. We pray that in your love and grace, they may be convicted of the damage they inflict on their victims, but also on themselves. And Lord, we pray for the murderers, that they might feel remorse and sorrow for their actions. And we pray that we can learn to leave the judgment of them in your hands. Loving God, we pray for the tyrants and dictators, for those who dominate nations, states, families and individuals. We pray that they may use their power to protect to champion and to deliver the weak instead of oppressing them. Father God, it's sometimes so hard for us to pray for those who we feel threatened, abused and used by. Remind us as we pray that they too are part of your creation and none are beyond your mercy and forgiveness. We pray that we might be strengthened and furnished by your spirit to show mercy and clemency, mirroring for them your compassion and grace. Father, remind us that within each one of us is the capacity to lie, to cheat, to abuse, to murder and to control. And that except by your good grace and your love, we too could belong in those, with those people. In our parish, we pray for those in need. Thank you, God, that you are the God who brings mercy and wholeness. Comfort and heal, we pray, all who are in sorrow, need, sickness or any other trouble. <coughs> On our parish prayer list, we pray for Merv, Larry, Pamela, Gary, Reverend David... Helen, Catherine, Judy, Grace. 
Glenn, Luke, Grant, Les, those who are grieving the loss of Kristen, those who are grieving the loss of Kelvin, Moira, Pauline, Patricia, Shirley, David and Maureen. Give to those who care for them wisdom, patience and gentleness and to us all your peace. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the faithful departed. We thank you for your servants in every age. Remembering Ron, Kristen, Josh, Dan and Chris and Kelvin. Grant that we and all your saints may be brought to a joyful resurrection and the fulfilment of your kingdom. Almighty God, you have promised to hear our prayers. Grant that what we have asked faith we may by your grace receive. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Gracious Lord, we ask you to accept our prayers through Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. Now and forever. Amen. Whenever you are praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. Christ has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and share his peace. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Our offertory hymn, Christ Be My Leader By Night As By Day. I don't know this hymn and I didn't know the other one, so sing up so I can learn it, please.
Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offering for the service of your kingdom and for your glory. Blessed be God for him. Let us lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right to give you our thanks and praise, O God. For we have tasted your goodness, and our lives are secure in your hands. You laid the cornerstone of creation and built earth and heaven by hand. Through your prophets, you promised to lay a stone in Zion as a place of refuge for your faithful ones and a stumbling block for those who reject your ways. In Jesus the Christ, your promise has been fulfilled. He came among us as the way, the truth and the life, and in him we have seen you. He was rejected and crucified, committing his spirit into your hands, but you raised him to new life and seated him at your right hand. Now he is preparing a place for us and drawing us to you, that we might be a holy priesthood and offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to you. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name forever praising you and singing. Merciful God, we thank you for these gifts of your creation, this bread and wine. And we pray that by your word and Holy Spirit, we who eat and drink them may be partakers of Christ's body and blood. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, and again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Saviour has commanded, proclaiming his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming again, we celebrate with this bread and this cup his one perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Renew us by your Holy Spirit, unite us in the body of your Son, and bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom and in whom in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father, in songs of never-ending praise.
this bread to share in the body of Christ. We who are many are one body. For we all share in the body. This is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. Jesus himself invites you. Jesus himself prepares the meal. Come, for all is ready.
eternal God, giver of life. In the breaking of the bread, we know the risen Lord. May we who celebrate this holy feast walk in his risen light and bring new life to all creation. Father, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Notices. Don has a notice. Thank you so much. So those piers that are going to be restored yes. um, come out today. Some strong men, please. And in the green room, because you're setting the church up differently. That'll be fun. I'll look forward to that. Um, as Don mentioned, Ron's funeral is here on Thursday at one o'clock. Please keep Gail and her family in your prayers. Gail lost her dad. And Jesus found him, it's all right. Are there any birthdays? People going away. Des and Jill, I think you should stand up and I'll come to you. Hmm? Oh, all right. Check this pair out. They've been married for 70 years. <laughs> Just like the Queen. <laughs> I'm sure she is. Yeah. Well done, you two. Can't get down here. Let's pray for Des and Jill. Gracious and loving God, thank you for this lovely couple. Thank you for their life together, for their love shared for 70 years, Lord. What a blessing you have been to them and they have been to people around them in their community, in the church and to their families. Lord, we ask you to pour your grace upon them, to surround them with your love and uphold them in your spirit. We ask all these things in the strong name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Stand for the blessing.
You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Therefore, go out as God's own people to proclaim the mighty acts of God in Jesus Christ. And may God be your rock and your refuge. May Christ Jesus take you to himself and be with you always. And may the Holy Spirit open heaven wide before you that you may see the glory of God in the things of earth. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn is Christ is the world's light. And it's true too. <laughs> 